and I and my boat were immediately and completely submerged by the water. And I made a very conscious choice at that point, and I asked very clearly that God's will be done. And the minute that I asked that, I was enveloped with a very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured that everything was fine. My spirit broke free from my body and I rose up and out of the river and I was immediately greeted by a group of spirits, beings, angels. They began taking me down this exceptionally beautiful path toward this uh, great dome structure of sorts that I knew was the entrance to heaven. Dr. Mary Neal tells her extraordinary story in her book, To Heaven and Back, which has been on the New York Times bestseller list for 17 weeks now. Mary, when you got there, what did heaven look like? There are no words, of course, to truly describe it. And the words we use don't quite make sense because when I think about what it looked like, it looked like infinite, unconditional love, kindness, and, of course, beauty. This uh, great hall of sorts exploded with color and beauty and an absolute and pure love, love of God. What did the, the spirits look like? Were they in, in sort of human form? Were they sort of ethereal? And did you recognize anybody there? Well, the spirits that greeted me were people I had known and loved as long as I existed, and I knew they had known me and loved me as long as I had existed. But it was very interesting. They, they had physical form, head, arms, body, and they were radiant. They were brilliant. I knew that they were from God and of God, but it's funny. Of course, I wish I had taken notes about, okay, now, let me, look, let me get a good look at you. Uh, but it's hard to understand now. At the time, it wasn't important to me to spend time identifying each and every one of them because I wanted desperately to get to this entrance of heaven. And it was as though we had plenty of time to chit chat and catch up later. And in the meantime, uh, you're underwater and I understand your knees broke and made your legs limp and that helped the, the water push you or, or, or well, the water, out of the kayak, right? Well, I was underwater upright in the boat and absolutely pressed to the front deck of the boat and the current ultimately sucked my body out of the boat and in doing that my knees went back on themselves and during that time period it was very interesting because I was being held I believe by Christ and reassured and went through a bit of a life review not so much looking at events but looking at all the unseen ripple effects of those events and and I could feel my knees bending back on themselves and I'm I'm an orthopedic surgeon I thought about that and I thought well that's interesting I don't have pain I know my bones are breaking I don't have fear I don't have panic I knew that I had been underwater too long to be alive well, but I felt more alive than I've ever felt. But 15 minutes, how is that possible that you were submerged underwater for 15 minutes? Well, if you talk to the people who resuscitated me, they would actually say that it was more like 30 minutes. I tend to go with 15 minutes because that was an absolute 15 minutes on the clock. And that is too long scientifically to be alive. And although my kids might say otherwise, they didn't suffer brain damage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Meanwhile, though, and I, then when you returned to your physical body, I, I know did. that you were told it's not your time. You returned right. to your physical body, and you, how did you feel? 
when you got back and you realized you were here? I was not happy about it. I had absolutely no desire to return. And two of the things that were surprising to me about heaven, and I have to say that I didn't really have any preconceptions about what dying might be like or what it might be like after I died. I was surprised by the fact that despite my wonderful family, I love my husband, I love my children more than I can imagine loving something on earth. I looked back at my body as they were doing CPR and I was not coming back. In fact, one of the people who was doing CPR was a young man, kept calling me back to take a breath and I would intermittently be overwhelmed with compassion for him. I would go back and take a breath and then leave. And it was interesting because I became so irritated with him. Because he wanted continuing to, be free. to keep calling me back. And he, as it turns out, was so irritated with me <laughs> because I would take a breath and then stop. Well, I know that later when you were in the hospital, you began to have visions, and one of them involved your son. Really, a terrifying prediction about him. We're going to find out what that was when we come back. We're back now with Dr. Mary Neal, whose best-selling book, To Heaven and Back, chronicles her vision of the afterlife following a near-death experience. Mary, I know you get to the hospital, and you start to, con or you continue to have sort of these visions. And in one of these visions, you're told something about your son. What was it? And with whom were you speaking at the time? I was speaking with Christ. And that sounds a little presumptuous always for me to say out loud, but that was one of the truly remarkable things about my experience is really coming to this realization and understanding of how that's true, that God really loves and knows each and every one of us, which is something that's difficult to understand. I should point out that you were not religious. I mean, you're, you were raised a Presbyterian. You would go to church occasionally, but you were not a person of deep faith, really. No. I perhaps should have been, <laughs> but I think I was very typical. You know, I had a busy life. I had a husband, four children, full-time job, and I did claim to be a Christian, and I certainly did go to church, but I was not overly religious. So and what were you told when you were in the hospital, Mary? Well, I was told a couple of things, several things, given somewhat mandates for my life, one of which had to do with my expected role at the time of my oldest son's death. And I had been told by my son when he was quite young that he would not live beyond 18. He told you that. He told me that many years prior. And so when I was told this uh, as one of the reasons for my return to earth, it did not come as a surprise. That you had to be there to comfort your family because your oldest son was going to die. It was not so much comforting my family as much as it was fulfilling a role for not just my family and community, but really the community in a more broad sense of showing people how to find the beauty in what would otherwise be considered a tragedy. Because the fact is there's always beauty. Ten years after this happened then, when your son, Willie, your oldest child, was 19, what happened? He was roller skiing. It's a dry land form of cross-country skiing, and he was hit by a car and killed instantly. Had you told anybody about this conversation you had, this experience you had in the hospital? Just before my son's 18th birthday, I was really anxious about it, and I finally told my husband. And I won't say that he was happy that I told him, but I told him, and then actually on his 18th birthday, I told my son. And you told Willie? I did. I did, because I truly believed at that point that God's plan for his life had changed. And what did he say? Well, he thought it was interesting, but he noted the fact that he did turn 18, and I think he thought it was interesting. And in fact, the day that he died, during the roller ski with a friend, he 
told his friend about this story. What do you hope people take away from your experience and this book? Well, what I really hope is to first of all fulfill one of my mandates which is sharing the story with others. And I hope that through reading my book, which is talking about life after death, but it's even more talking about how to find God in your own life. I hope that people make this transition from faith to an absolute trust that all the promises of God are true. It's hard to understand, but God really does love each one of us intensely, have a plan for each one of us, and we need to be about the business of figuring out what that is and not wasting our time. I feel like if people can really just accept that there really is life after death and forget their fear of death, they can more fully engage in life. Well, Dr. Mary Neal, it's really interesting to talk to you and I so appreciate your coming by. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Mary. I really appreciate and it. When we come back, a boy says he also knows that heaven is for real because he saw it with his very own eyes. Today we're talking about heaven. Colton Burpo was just a little boy when he had a near-death experience that would change his life forever. Take a look. At first glance, Colton Burpo looks like an average American kid, a 13-year-old from a close-knit family living in Imperial, Nebraska. But what Colton says happened to him is anything but ordinary. The main thing that I remember is that I got to see Jesus, my great-grandfather Pop, my sister who's already there, and then I also got to meet David, um, Samson, and ten of the apostles, Peter and John. Colton's memory is from nine years ago, when, just shy of his fourth birthday, he felt gravely ill. By the time the doctors uh, realized what he was really suffering from, he'd been poisoned by about five days, and that led to him being just so terribly sick. The cause was a burst appendix. Colton was rushed into emergency surgery, and it was during that surgery that he says he had an astonishing experience, a trip to heaven. That's when he talks about uh, sitting on Jesus' lap, the angels singing to him. I think a lot of people think sometimes miracles are reserved for like special people. And my family is very normal, Colton's a, a, a normal kid. But I think we just serve an extraordinary God who wants to show himself and make himself known in people's lives. Colton's astounding journey about, story about his journey rather to heaven inspired the best-selling book, Heaven is for Real, which has been read by more than 7 million people. Colton is here today with his father, Todd, who wrote the book, and his mom, Sonia. Hi. Hi. Nice to Hi. see you all. So, Colton, I know that you didn't tell your dad about your experiences right away. It took a while. How, how did you explain to him what you had experienced? Well, actually, right after I came out of surgery, when I got back from heaven, I tried to share the story with my dad. It's just he didn't want to listen because he didn't want me to give up because I was fighting to stay alive. And what did you tell him? What, what did you want to share with him? I just wanted to share my experience of heaven with him, tell him what I saw. And did you see, you know, we've been talking about this story with our staff. Did, did you see animals or pets in heaven? Because a lot of people want to know that. Yes, I did. You did? In what form? Well, they have pretty much every single animal we have here on Earth, like dogs, yes, cats. <laughs> um, Not a cat person, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Even like lions, elephants, pretty much every single animal here on Earth is up in heaven. No, I'm not sure if your pet made it to heaven, but I know there are pets in heaven. What did you think, Todd, when your son started talking this way? I was questioning. You know, I, I was not prepared to have even these conversations with my son. And what do you ask? You know, uh, people say, but you're a pastor. Yeah, and I'd like to say that I, I embraced this, but I didn't. I, I questioned it first, too. And just like he said, when the hospital, he said, Dad, you know, I almost died. When he first started talking, he didn't say, hey, I'm in heaven, I saw Jesus. It scared me. 
because I, I, I didn't.